fish, which is, uh, I don't know if the father or the big brother or any way, let's say a close <laughs> relative to the impact chain since he uh, and uh, Stefan Steiderbauer uh, uh, really contributed to pioneer this uh, uh, approach uh, several years ago now. Uh, sorry to disclose if direct information on your age. Uh, and uh, uh, this, I think, is uh, uh, I think a nice chance uh, to review the original concept of impact chains, uh, how the impact chains have been uh, also evolving recently, since these are really a work in progress. Uh, and I will give the floor to Mark uh, in a moment. Afterwards, uh, I will just, uh, let's say, uh, dive a little bit more in how, to which extent uh, the impact chain concepts have to be extended and modified. Uh, in Paratus, or at least uh, uh, give a couple of examples, and then we will have hopefully some time for a uh, question and answer time. Uh, but this, anyway, this would not uh, will just start the activities related to impact chains. Uh, maybe if Mark, uh, if you can just briefly introduce yourself, uh, and then uh, you can yeah, get started yeah. as soon as you want. Yes, yeah, so Mike Tibisch from URAC Research. Um, I my background is climate impact research, basically originally doing PhD at the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research. So I'm I'm doing climate risk research since 20 years, you could say, even if for the first 15 years it was called climate vulnerability research. So the, the name of the concept changed a bit. Yeah, and, and now I'm heading uh, the institute and currently we are um, establishing a center for climate change and transformation yeah and so i'm not not directly involved in the paratus project but i'm in close contact with max and we will um let's say provide or contribute with this project um amongst others with this concept of impact change and we hope that it might be useful for your um analysis and your approaches so let's see if the control works yes i can forward it perfect um yeah, maybe let's uh, go immediately into the matter. So my first slides will be not on impact chains itself, but on climate risk. And I guess that the risk concept in general is very familiar to you. Um, so they will be not something dramatic new. Um, and I know that also Paratus is not only on climate risk, um, but maybe it's still interesting for you to to follow um, these, um, let's say, this concept of climate risk because um, my feeling is that the climate risk world takes risk a bit more holistic, so it's going deeper into social ecological sectors and systems than the classical disaster risk perspective, which has often a quite, let's say, engineer driven approach um, on, on risk and vulnerability. So you might still see that there are some differences. And that's why I'm always referring to IPCC definitions. So according to which climate risk is the potential for adverse consequences for human or ecological system. Maybe here already with this ecologic, you see that there is a bit of difference between the, let's say, classical DIR perspective, which has already extended already now with the UNDR GAR reports and so on. So it includes ecosystems, but also the social system, cultural assets, livelihoods, and so on. Um, so I think what is important to um, understand is um, that risk is not something completely objective and measurable, but it's very much related to the objective targets and values. So what do you want to protect? What do you want to achieve? What are your um, targets which might be threatened by the risk? And it's usually not only on single risk, but it's on cascading risks through different systems. So often um, an impact start at the ecosystem level. So for example, um, after a drought, grasslands are affected, they dried out. So then the, the these type of grasslands can absorb less water in case of a heavy rain. So the risk of um, landslides is increasing and then these landslides may hit um, infrastructure or even sectors. So that's a bit this idea. Um, yeah, and maybe what is important for us to learn, you know it from the more natural hazard perspective, um, climate risk was often taken a bit synonymously with climate impact. And um, and we know that risk is a different perspective. The so risk is really things which should not happen. So basically when the, when the shit hits the fans or when, when something really dramatically happens. And that's something which we in the climate community had to learn that we are not reporting on any single small impact, but that we are really looking to these deep adverse consequences, severe adverse consequences. And, and this one you also know very much so that um, 
the drivers of any type of risk are hazard exposure vulnerability. This has only been taken up um, since AR5 in the IPCC world, in the climate world, before they were mainly referring to vulnerability, even with a bit of a different meaning. So here, the climate change community learned a lot. We um, translated this concept, this risk propeller, into something more like a flow chart. And this is already the backbone or the framework which is behind the impact chain. So we took exactly these um, concepts. So risk is a function of exposure, hazard and vulnerability. But what we added is that we said um, from hazard to adverse consequences, usually there is what is in between our potential impacts and often not only one impact, but a full cascade of impacts. And there it's getting interesting because then every single impact has its own related vulnerability. It's affecting different exposed systems. So then in the end, it's not anymore something which you can simply visualize with a propeller, but you need cascading impact chains. And that's where the name comes from to explain the adverse consequences and the risks. Then, of course, um, for us, this dynamic is important. So we are always looking at the current state, so the current climate related risk and on the potential future. And we want to understand how climate change is affecting um, climate related hazards, climate extremes, um, including also these more slow onset process like sea level rise or glacier melt. And what is also important is um, the more we go into social systems, to not only check the direct risk drivers, but also other underlying risk drivers. So this could be, for example, population increase or um, increase in, in Europe. For example, it's often urban sprawl. So we are living here in the mountains. We see more and more um, hazard zones getting populated by commercial sites, for example. So um, there often the risk is not driven by climate extremes or climate change, but by the other, un other underlying risk drivers. Um, yeah, maybe for the hazards, it's also interesting if we um, talk about climate and climate change so that we have, of course, on one hand, the classical climate related hazards due to extreme weather events so like drought, heat, storms, heavy rain events and so on. Um, and usually these uh, these two things are distinguished when we are talking about climate change, extreme weather events and this so-called slow onset Sometimes they're even called slow onset events, which I think is a wrong term because um, these are not events, these are processes like, for example, increasing aridity. So which might sound similar like drought, but here we are really talking if a region in the long term is getting drier and drier and a drought is an event which can even maybe take a year or so, um, but it has a start and an end. Um, and what is, of course, important and we know it in the meanwhile that even these slow onset processes having an effect on the extreme events. So the increasing temperatures are, of course, increasing, for example, the magnitude of heat and then increasing aridity would increase the magnitude and frequency of droughts or the rising sea level is increasing frequency and magnitude of storm surges. So we always have to take um, this relation into account. Um, we did this figure um, and you will immediately see it uh, when, we, when I open the right hand side. We did this for um, UN, a UNDR report on comprehensive climate risk assessment where UNDR understands as comprehensive, including even the a bit more the DR perspective. And therefore we had a look also on the non-climatic hazards and the relationship between climate and non-climatic hazards. And there is, of course, a relation. And I think this has to be taken into account. So either extreme events can trigger um, non-climatic hazards, such as landslides, for example. Um, other hazards, for example, such as deforestation, can be underlying risk drivers. Um, so deforestation can, for example, lead um, in combination with uh, heavy rain events can lead to more runoff of floods or they can happen compound. So, for example, um, even um, if after an earthquake, there's a heavy rain event, um, the probability of landslides may increase. So this is also something which happens. So we have to take this into account. I will not read the definition. That's maybe too long. Yeah, vulnerability, of course, you, you know what vulnerability is. Um, it's in general um, the propensity or the predisposition to be adversely affected. Maybe here it's also um, 
a bit similar like in the DR domain um, that vulnerability is has been really extended in the last decades basically towards um, social vulnerability um, even looking very much into institutional capacities for example the lack of capacity to prepare prevent respond cope or adapt um, and these aspects have to be taken into account and they're often explaining even adverse consequences i mean this is classical thing if you compare um, the impact of uh, one event in two countries you often see that these the difference in adverse consequences can be explained um, by different for example uh, um, capacities to to respond to to the risk or to the impact um yeah exposure maybe there um this is maybe a bit a uh, um, extension, not a difference between DR and CCA or climate change um, perspective, but maybe important is to say that um, the exposure side is more and more seen not only, only as physical assets or people and livelihood. So I think maybe the first three would be the typical domains which are also considered in natural hazard risk but it's extended to sector and system. So that could be something like tourism or even the financial sector, but even to functions. So I think the, the latest recommendations is a bit um, to try to assess the adverse consequences on functions. And functions could be, for example, food security. So then it's not agriculture as a sector or crops as a physical um, system, but it's food security, which is including even if um, if uh, foods could be imported from other countries or it's transport, so not any more roads um, and, and infrastructure related to transport, but the transport itself. So can people still move from A to B? Things like that. So I think this is a bit a new perspective. And at least we see that exposure um, has two dimensions, if you want so. The first dimension is that exposure describes who or what is exposed. So for example, um, let's say food security is the exposed system, and then the degree of exposure. And the degree, um, for example, um, might depend on attributes such as numbers, densities, or economic economic values. So if you take the example um, of food security, it's always a question, of course, how many people have to be um, supplied with food. And the more people there are, um, the, the higher is the exposure. So other underlying risk drivers, um, I, I was talking already um, about that a bit. So these could be really quite complex, such as poverty, social injustice, but also, for example, conflicts. So if there are a uh, civil war in a region, for example, it's clear that the civil war increased the vulnerability. Uh, from a, let's say, system perspective, we tried to distinguish a bit um, that everything which is more or less under control within a region by the risk owners or risk managers is vulnerability and, and or exposure and the underlying risk drivers are more bigger processes which cannot immediately managed by risk managers so a risk manager cannot manage the civil war or even not a demographic development but he or she has to take it into account and um, has to take the um, effect on vulnerabilities into account so now finally this was just the framework now finally um how we translate these in impact chains. It's really from now on, it's quite straightforward because we simply take all these definitions and all the frameworks and for concrete um, climate related, but also not climate related impacts, consequences and risks, um, we build chains. So we start with the hazard. So for example, increase of heavy precipitation. Then we go through the different impacts which may happen. Um, there might be direct impact, impact such an increase in flood events and then indirect impacts such an increase of damage due, due to flood events. Um, so most of the indirect impacts will have an exposed system like in this case property and buildings in flood prone areas and then there might be a chain so that um, these impact might have um, a third order impact, if you want so, increase of homeless and injured people due to floods, which is affecting a different exposed system. So this is a bit the logic. So um, to start with a hazard or even multiple hazards are of course possible, and then go through this cascading chain of impact, um, uh, note which systems are exposed, 
and also, of course, then analyze the vulnerability factors. Um, and you see already that vulnerability factors here um, can include very physical one, like reduced natural retention capacity. Wetland degradation is almost an underlying risk driver because that's something which is happening. But we have, of course, also more um, planning related vulnerability factors such as, for example, the lack of urban planning, which is then leading to insufficient protection measures for flooding. Um, other in underlying risk drivers like population increase may increase the impact um, or, or even the exposure, of course. So the more people are living in flood prone areas, the higher is the exposure and then the higher is the impact. Um, and all this together then leads to a risk which we um, basically um, define a bit in the IPCC logic. So it's either the risk of something here, in this case, risk of damage to property and loss, loss of lives due to flooding or the risk to someone. So it could even be the risk to people living in flood prone areas. Um, and this impact chain, if you want, so is first just a graphical representation of, of the story behind the risk, um, taking into account this logic. And then with these impact chains, you can do a lot of things. You can use this as an analytical framework to go now through the single factors. So to analyze, okay, how much has heavy precipitation increased in this region? By how many millimeters? Where? You can show maps here. Um, even here, you can look for indicators. So do we know something about deforestation? How many percent of forest has been um, uh, um, deforested in the last 20 years? What's future scenarios? Do we think that deforestation will go on? Do we have observations or models on the impacts? Do we have numbers on how many people are living in flood prone areas? So the, the idea is then really to use this as um, an analytical framework to go through the single, single factors and look for evidence. Um, and um, then there are different ways how to get finally to the risk. So in the past, we were, for example, heavily using composite indicators. So we were even in a GIS really constructing things and to come up with one vulnerability or risk map in the end. Um, so we stepped a bit away from that in many applications because we saw that for many factors you will not get data and we do, do it now a bit more expert based so that we collect all the evidence and then afterwards um, we assess the risk in, a, in an expert round saying okay taking all the evidence into account um, how adverse are the consequences how likely are adverse consequences and what is our final evaluation on the risk and this of course usually um, um, uh, prepares um, um, adaptation planning in our context. Maybe I step back here because I think there's another slide on that. Um, so usually the goal of such an analysis is to help adaptation planners to see where are the weak points in a system. So for example, in this case, if the analysis found out that obviously deforestation is one of the factors which is leading to this risk, there you might be able to do something against de deforestation. You might be able to replant um, trees or to, uh, to secure slopes and so on. So that's also a bit an indication what you can do. Or if there's a lack of urban planning, naturally you should invest in urban planning. Maybe what is, um, I mean, this was a simple chain, just to say these chains can get endless complex and there are also some limits from uh, from the layout things so of how, how much complex risks you can um, still include. And they can really include different um, uh, different exposed systems. For example, this is a, a snapshot basically of a chain we did on the summer drought last year. And here you see already the soil, water, forest, agriculture, human health, energy, freshwater ecosystem, transport. So there are several systems which are affected and we see all the cascading impacts across the different systems. And in green, the specific vulnerabilities which contribute to this um, impact and everything which is a gray box with the red um, border could already be um, a first level risk. So there could be even risks which then are nested to an overall risk. So that means risk can really be complex. Um, that's maybe the, the main important message here. So it, it can be a consequence of compound events, cascading impact across multiple exposed system and functions. And in the worst case, it can even become systemic. So systemic, as you probably would know, 
would really mean that it's threatening core functions of a system. For example, if food security is threatened um, by uh, a chain of impacts, so this would be really a systemic risk, which is, of course, um, should be absolutely avoided because they are really difficult to combat. Um, maybe what is interesting, at least in the case of climate change, is a kind of scaling issue that um, climate risks are, of course, not only um, local. So a region might even be affected by climate risks from outside the region or even the country. You know, So there might be even a climate impact on China, which has then an impact on food security in Africa, for example, because China is not delivering wheat to Africa. So just to say that um, this complexity is simply what we observe when it comes to climate risk, and this can be incorporated in these impact chains. Um, yeah, maybe I have to speed up a bit. I don't know how much time we have. Um, I would just like to show you another example from our region. Um, so something which, which simply happened here, actually uh, from 2018 to this year, um, as an example of these cascading impacts where it makes sense to build impact chains. So we, we had a heavy storm, really um, a very unusual storm, which uh, um, was hitting our region by surprise, the wire storm 2018, which um, destroyed 6,000 hectares of forest in our region, um, which was even related a bit to climate change because the intensity is probably can be partly explained to to a very warm Mediterranean Sea where these Genua deep pressure um, situations are, um, let's say, refilled with energy. So then we had similar events just one month later in November, um, and this was not then not storm was not the problem, but uh, heavy snow. So very wet, heavy snow, which again damaged the forest. Then we had these record heat and drought last year, which furthermore damaged the forest and lead to a big um, bark beetle attack. And now um, some um, mountains in our region look like that. And you can imagine, I mean, here's a road, so there are electric grids and so on, settlements. You can imagine that these cascade, so over four years from storm, snow, um, drought, bark beetle, can then lead again to further consequences because these forests, of course, should protect the road from um, rockfall, landflies, avalanches. Um, and all the trees which are here brownish are definitely dead, so they will probably have to be removed and then the protection function is reduced. Um, yeah, I think here, I don't know, I think I can jump over that, Max, if you yeah, agree, that's because okay. that's quite, quite on the policy side. Ah, okay, maybe here you would like to step in, Max. Uh, yes, uh, can you just uh, give me back control because uh, I'm a bit stuck here. Okay. So let me see if I can. Okay, thank you, thank you very much, Mark. Uh, maybe we can uh, we can continue and then we can uh, stop and let people uh, ask uh, questions. Uh, basically, uh, what you have just seen uh, is uh, okay. I have control. Uh, is a, a, a said very nice explanation of impact chains, and I think most of you already realized that the impact chain as a concept uh, is not necessarily uh, constrained to climate risk. Uh, let's say it takes into account fully the the approach uh, of uh, let's say conceptualization of risk, which is anyway fundamental to disaster risk reduction and. Uh, Thanks to the recent evolution of the AR5 and the AR6, uh, these concepts are also being fully embraced basically by the climate risk community. And uh, uh, pretty much all the concepts that Mark explained that can be uh, almost rigidly translated into a different uh, uh, operational environment where instead of uh, uh, the climate uh, uh, let's say change, uh, we are looking at uh, uh, one or more specific events which uh, share anyway several characteristics with climate change, the complexity, the, uh, the, the, the uh, existence of comp compounded uh, cascading effects, uh, um, the stretch over different time, time scales, uh, uh, the systemic uh, uh, impacts and so on. Uh, the uh, example that Mark showed, uh, the, the, the VIA, uh, the Iron Storm, which is also one of the learning cases of Paratus, uh, uh, it's also uh, something where we first, uh, uh, let's say, a couple of years ago, uh, started thinking about using impact chains uh, in the context of disaster, disaster risk reduction. 
and uh, uh, we explored a little bit uh, uh, this concept. And what I'm showing now to you is just an example of uh, an impact chain. Uh, so the very same concept of impact chain that Mark explained, but applied to the via uh, the via uh, example, where we have, uh, in this case, uh, uh, two different hazards. Uh, so the heavy rain and the strong wind that were compounded in the in the days between uh, 28th and 3rd of October 2018. Uh, we have uh, quite some, uh, uh, let's say, intermediate impact. Uh, and then we have, of course, the exposure in this, in this case, uh, uh, was constrained to population, residential buildings, road infrastructure, and protective force, which is uh, uh, a building block for then uh, uh, better understanding the long-term uh, risk which are related to this event. Uh, while, for instance, in this case, the risk is uh, more generically, uh, so the risk that was considered for this impact chain is generically injuries and loss of lives and properties. And then we have a set of uh, vulnerability uh, factors uh, uh, which uh, are uh, somehow relevant uh, uh, in this particular case. So you see that, uh, uh, let's say, the, the translation of the concept within uh, the scenario-based uh, assessment is relatively straightforward, and uh, there are a few other things which are, I think, quite interesting to, to be noted. Uh, for instance, the fact that, uh, and this is something that we would like really to further extend and explore altogether in Paratus, uh, we can better understand and conceptualize uh, how the different uh, impacts uh, which are then leading to risks uh, are uh, unfolding uh, over different time frames and different con let's say conditions so to say so for instance if we think about uh, relatively short term uh, uh, let's say consequences uh, also related to via and always taking into account only two hazards so heavy rain and strong wind which were compounded uh, we can imagine that uh, uh, the falling of trees uh, uh, can be uh, related to the disruption of road traffic or road functionalities uh, and this can also disrupt the uh, let's say the, the functionalities of the search and rescue services uh, and increase the, uh, the hazard for, uh, for road accidents. And this can also contribute to the uh, risk to people. Uh, while at the same time, the very same, uh, let's say, uh, impact, which is the felling of trees due to the strong wind, can also lead to disruption of telecoms uh, and power. And then this can also uh, cascade uh, over and spill over uh, say into, for instance, a different transportation systems such as rail railway or other type of uh, lifelines and infrastructure. Uh, so what is interesting is that, uh, uh, and I'm not here, I'm not showing the vulnerability, uh, I'm just showing the impacts uh, and the chain of impacts. And what you can see is that we can easily conceptualize uh, quite a complex set of impacts uh, with, uh, let's say, causal relationships connecting them. And uh, what is also interesting, uh, and I think this is also something that will be very nice to further explore, is the concept of timing and the, the time over which uh, those impacts and their, and their associated risks are uh, unfolding. For instance, uh, uh, if you are, say, focusing on the uh, effects on, uh, say, telecom, for instance, uh, we can see that uh, this type of uh, uh, what I would call a, a risk or impact pathway, which we can, uh, let's say, highlight, emphasize within a complex, a more complex uh, conceptualization, uh, is taking place in a relatively short time, so in a matter of hours, uh, and uh, uh, as relatively short as well uh, uh, recovery time, so in the matter of a few days, uh, perhaps uh, up to a couple of weeks. So we see that uh, within the same impact chain, we can select uh, risk or impact pathways, uh, analyze how a set of cascading, uh, let's say, impacts have been has been unfolding, and then uh, also place it into a timeline in order to better understand uh, at which extent this is going to impact the underlying socioeconomical uh, sociological systems in the same uh, representation we can go from uh, such an impact uh, pathway which is uh, anyway taking into account the recovery uh, let's say is is being uh, let's say is, is happening over a few days or up to one or two weeks time uh, to a different type of uh, um, uh, risk pathways. In this case, uh, the very same felling of trees uh, can uh, increase the, 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 the risk for a wildfire, can lead to uncontrolled spread of uh, bark beetle, as Mark uh, mentioned, can also 
in turn uh, change the uh, overall hazard for uh, landslides or avalanches due to the fact that several areas, uh, uh, say covered with protective forests, have been destroyed. And this type of uh, pathway is, uh, uh, of course, very much causally connected with the same event which happened in 2018, but this time can also unfold over a much longer time frame because the pattern of damage recovery and damage uh, which is related to these cascading effects can really, uh, let's say, take uh, place over several years. So we are now uh, in the fifth year after the event and probably we are reaching now the peak uh, of the bark beetle infestation. Um, and uh, of course, what is also interesting is that, uh, first of all, whether or to which extent in Paratus we want to take into account this kind of a longer term perspective. But this is very important from the uh, stakeholder and the civil protection authorities. So this is something that I would suggest to really consider. On the other side, what is also interesting is that, uh, and this is also quite different of, with respect to several, uh, let's say, kind of a disaster risk, uh, reduction related application, when uh, we have uh, or we decide to take uh, into account uh, impacts which are unfolding over the space, uh, so the time of years, uh, uh, then of course uh, several other things can can happen. We we might have uh, in in this period also other droughts. We can have other extreme events, as it happened also in the case uh, in in our case uh, in the last years. And this of course is increasing the complexity, but is also uh, really um, exposing the complexity, which is something the uh, end user have to take. Uh, uh, as to come to terms with. So, uh, just to this was just to give you an example. Uh, now, for a for a small change, I wanted to uh, talk uh, uh, very briefly about how to do uh, impact chains, uh, practically speaking. And there are really a number of different uh, options. Uh, of course, the the basic option, which is the, definitely not uh, the, the worst one. Uh, on the contrary, is really having a piece of paper uh, like a, a board and a, a marker and a post it and work with people. This is always very nice. Um, but we've been also working with other bit more, uh, let's say, technological uh, means. Also, unfortunately, due to the uh, recent pandemics that really forced many of us of doing this type of work course from remote and that, that also turned out to be an interesting uh, experience. So from on, on the one side, for instance, I, I can just mention several of them and then we will provide a bit more of a structure, the inf information and guidelines in the next weeks. But for instance, we have been exploring the use of Kumu, which is a, a web-based uh, interface to draw, uh, let's say, graph-based um, structures. And uh, also include information to, into those structures, uh, uh, both in terms of the individual factors, uh, for instance, that are composite impact chains, but also in terms of the connections which are, uh, let's say, linking those factors uh, among themselves. And this is something that uh, is actually maybe not that uh, appealing visually, but is quite uh, useful to really take, uh, uh, let's say, uh, stock of all the different information document uh, impact chains uh, also down to the to the, to the smaller uh, say elements this uh, proved actually quite uh, interesting and useful although of course uh, the the complexity of the impact chains which are basically coming out of this uh, is relatively high and not necessarily uh, this is the best option to be uh, communicated uh, when we have to communicate this to uh, the civil protection or other stakeholders which might not you know be able to you know, uh, make sense of this complexity. Uh, anyway, the tool is actually quite nice and you can also focus on certain aspects, uh, do some very uh, low level of network analysis, uh, uh, change the visualization styles. So this is something that I would definitely uh, consider, so to say, in a more operational environment. Another uh, tool that we, we are also using uh, is called uh, Miro. So all of those are actually commercial tools, but where it's possible to have, uh, let's say, free subscriptions and use them. So uh, we are just uh, basically exploring many different chances. In this case, the Miro board is basically kind of a virtual uh, uh, board where co collaboratively, uh, you know, people di from different institutions or from different places can uh, share thoughts, uh, discussion, and it's also quite nicely 
done from the visual perspective. So one thing that we've been doing, for instance, is to use Kumu to create like basic impact chains. Then uh, let's say load those impact chains as just as images into this uh, uh, mirror board. Uh, and then uh, collaboratively with uh, experts from different uh, sectors, for instance, uh, uh, discuss over those uh, impact chains and add uh, post-its, uh, add the notes, uh, add whatever other type of, uh, uh, let's say, information during this collaborative uh, uh, experience. And this really proved also interesting as a way to kind of advance the discussion and bring in uh, illicit information from uh, different types of stakeholders. Uh, and this is also is, uh, I mean, relatively easy to accommodate also uh, plots, uh, figures, uh, uh, let's say spreadsheets and so on. So it might actually be quite a nice way, especially when working from remote, uh, to really make the most out of this uh, uh, the collaborative interaction. Uh, another and, and the, 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 the connection between Kumo and uh, Miro is also uh, actually quite uh, useful um, when it comes to communication. So when we have to communicate uh, um, uh, impact chains, for instance, uh, for, for embedding them in reports uh, or uh, let's say bringing them to the attention of uh, end users in presentations uh, and where the complexity of the uh, the underlying complexity of impact chain, as we do it, for instance, in Kumo and other, uh, in other, let's say, environments, uh, is actually exceeding perhaps the capacity of people to, uh, to, to uh, uh, intuitively understand them and use them, uh, which of course uh, is taking some time and some uh, learning curve. Then uh, what we found actually quite useful is uh, to maybe have a keep Kumu to kind of, uh, uh, let's say, keep the, the you know, store the information in a structured way and then uh, use Miro, uh, but then of course also PowerPoint can be used for this or whatever other type of, uh, let's say, of um, graphical design uh, tool to create a kind of a simplified description of those impact chains, which are a bit more appealing, a bit more easily understandable, and that, that can then be used in an iterative cycle. Uh, to refine the basic concepts, the prioritize factors, uh, and advance the discussion. Uh, I'm also mentioning Excel because uh, for us it's very important uh, uh, to uh, not just uh, you know use uh, impact chains as a way to discuss uh, things, uh, which is anyway very useful, but also important to uh, store uh, as much as possible the knowledge and the information which the impact chains are, are allowing us to elicit from uh, different sources. And for doing this, we also uh, often uh, lately are using Excel, as simple as that, uh, which is uh, uh, giving us a way to, uh, let's say, structure this information in a way which is uh, uh, also machine readable, and that can be used later on for uh, inserting those impact chains into a database, uh, uh, doing some kind of, uh, uh, let's say, post-processing to the information, uh, making it a bit more uh, actionable from the perspective also of uh, practical applications. Uh, last but not, and okay, this is just an example of how, let's say, uh, an Excel uh, sheet, uh, uh, let's say, document would look like for the for the Vaya one. We will also provide examples of this. Uh, you will see that this is of course, uh, not really a good way of communicating or discussing, but it's a really a real good way of uh, uh, keeping and storing this information and then reusing this and, and sharing with other people, which is a very important aspect. Uh, last but not least, of course, uh, the, the, let's say since uh, it's relatively clear, or might be clear to you that uh, uh, there is no, <laughs> let's say, uh, one-stop shop for impact chains. Uh, we are also exploring the use of uh, customized web-based interfaces. Uh, also, the, let's say, even a bit more sophisticated uh, uh, system where the impact chains are also stored in a uh, database or semantic database, and then, uh, let's say, can be interacted with uh, to uh, web-based interface. Uh, this is just an example. Uh, of a system which is called uh, CRISP uh, that we are developing right now. And then you, you might actually recognize the, the, the classical kind of uh, uh, spider-like uh, structure of the impact chain, but the system is actually uh, allowing people to uh, interact with individual nodes, uh, uh, individual factors, uh, uh, check uh, the information which is stored in this factor, um, uh, do some advanced querying, also using semantic capabilities, uh, and maybe that's something that we might consider also 
uh, in, in Paratus in order to give impact chains also a much higher degree of uh, usability and also machine uh, compatibility, so to say. Okay, um, let's say there was just a, a very quick introduction uh, to how you know this concept might actually be almost immediately taken over in Paratus. Uh, summarizing uh, uh, for us, impact chains uh, are, and I think this is uh, something that really came up uh, really strongly in the proposal of Paratus, uh, are a natural solution for application oriented risk conceptualization. They are very powerful to elicit knowledge from experts, uh, integrated knowledge from different sources. Uh, accommodate both quantitative and qualitative components, uh, capture the complexity uh, of, uh, let's say, scenarios where we have different causative impacts, uh, but also different uh, factors which are uh, playing a role, emphasize also the role of vulnerability in a more, let's say, quantitative, let's say, approach, uh, where uh, sometimes vulnerability kind of, you know, uh, tends to be singled out, but is really has to be taken into account. And for us, it's also a way to foster, actually, and push forward the standardization and also taxonomic consistency of all the different concepts which are making uh, the, um, the concept of uh, uh, impact chains. Now, within Paratus, we are expecting to extend the impact chains uh, uh, as we already started doing, as I showed you in, uh, in the Transalp project that just finished, uh, to better capture even based risks and multi other multi risks, uh, integrate the impact chain within a forensic analysis framework. Uh, uh, and also use them, uh, explore at least uh, as much as possible their use as a conceptual tool, as a basic conceptual tool to support, uh, to support quantitative risk analysis in WP4 and connect them to uh, other, let's say, more application-oriented interfaces. What's next uh, now? Let's say the, today's was just uh, kind of a first, uh, uh, let's say, a primer to the concept of impact chains. In the next weeks, uh, uh, we will provide you with uh, a bit more of a documentation, uh, a couple of examples, uh, some basic guidelines uh, to really make sure that you can start, uh, uh, let's say, being acquainted with such uh, an approach. Uh, then we can have, as was also mentioned and requested, a joint training uh, where we can just build together one impact chain with whoever uh, of you is uh, interested and will be also uh, using this uh, tool, uh, especially within the learning and the test cases. Uh, and this might even happen already before the end of February, just to get started. Uh, ready for the for the uh, workshops in the test cases, uh, and then of course we will be able to supervise and support, uh, uh, let's say, all the activities which are related with impact chains uh, in both the learning and test case scenarios. And but this will be discussed within uh, the context of WP1 and the other uh, work packages in the next weeks. And that's it. Uh, I hope that was not actually too tough and too dense for for all of you. Uh, but if there are questions, we'll be happy to. Uh, answer and discuss it now.